Hello, and welcome to another question and answer series. Today we have two questions. The first question comes from Ass by YouTube comments. How do you prevent back rounding on the deadlift, mainly the upper back? I, I have high bar back squat at 190 kilos, ass to grass, beltless, and my back stayed dead straight, yet can only deadlift 205 kg with a belt, and that's still with a little bit of back rounding. Doesn't mean I have weak abs. I just want to get my back strength up so that my cleans can go up. That's taking technique out of it, of course. Okay, so to answer your question, ass, we're just gonna explain the differences between like a high bar squat, a low bar squat, and a deadlift squat in terms of uh, lever arms and how that affects your back position. And then after that, we, well, we're gonna talk about how to kind of fix it for yourself. So coming up now is a little diagram of a squat, a diagram of a deadlift, and then stickman diagrams that are obviously pretty rough and not drawn to scale but they'll kind of illustrate my point. So this is a still capture of a squat. This is a medium kind of squat. As you can see, the back's in a fairly um, narrow footprint and the, bars, the weight of the bar is pretty much in the middle of that footprint. This is a deadlift. As you can see, there's a larger footprint um, and the back's right in the middle of that footprint and the back's kind of an exposed long position. And this kind of puts you in the the position where rounding is going to occur. This is um, the stickman diagrams. So left side bar, middle is kind of low bar, and right deadlift. And you can see the the size of the lever arms involved at the bottom, with the high bar high bar squat being the smallest, low bar squat being the medium, and deadlift being the biggest. In the high bar squat situation, the spine's being loaded in pretty much in a complete vertical manner, or in compression, and that's um, where your back's happiest is in compression. And the low bar squats slightly is still in compression, but there's more of a lever arm and there's more trunkling. This leads to more shear forces going through the spine. And um, this has the, the longer lever arm multiplies the force bit in applied, and it also increases the amount of horizontal force vectors going through your spine, which increases the shear. Your your spine is not very happy in shear. It's designed to be compressed, not loaded. Um, actually or certainly not loaded actually with a lot of force and then deadlift this situation comes even worse and um, with the load being out in front of the spine and um, your back being pretty much horizontal to the floor or some derivative of horizontal to the floor and having a much larger lever arm this increase in lever arm increases massively the demand on the muscles of the hamstring the glutes and also more specifically for our case of the erector spiny and all the muscles along the spine that are postural muscles designed to hold position. This increase in force demand normally comes to a compromise where your body decreases the lever arm by rounding at the spine. And that, that's kind of the your body's coping mechanism for that situation. If you, the muscles of the lower back and the muscles of the spine or the postural muscles of the lower back and postural muscles of the spine aren't strong enough to hold the position, they'll shorten the lever arm by rounding and that inc decreases the footprint that you have and decreases the lever arm which decreases the force demand which makes it easier to lift the weight. Okay so what we have here is a diagram of L4 and L5 and what you'll see in the middle of the two discs there's a small there's a pink fleshy bit. This is a sack of fluid that allows your spine to articulate either an extension or flexion. Now what happens under load when it's flexed like we we're talking about before when your body employs the the rounding to shorten the lever arm what happens is it'll pinch one end of this which um, puts a lot of pressure on one, en one end and in a particularly extreme case where there's a lot of pressure applied quickly so if you go from a neutral position to a rounded position quickly under load that can lead to slip disc also you'll see there's a lot of ligaments and tendons around um, the joint these can get damaged or they can get occur micro damage when they're required to extend against a flexion um, or to change dynamically this micro damage can lead to um, a build up uh, and a build up of um, damage which when it doesn't get a chance to repair leads to overuse injuries so if you deadlift three times a week with bad form and the tendon or the, the ligaments are taking small bits of damage each time you do it and they aren't getting a chance to remodel, eventually they'll fail and that leads to an overuse injury. And now to get back to your point, um, 
your, your the limit of your um, strength in that position is down to the, the limit of the posture muscles in your back. So they need to act isometrically to hold that position or that neutral spine position. And the, the best way, the only way to build that up is to build it up in situ, to build it up in exercises where you're you're required to act under load in that position at the, in the same sort of back angle you come through in a deadlift. So to achieve that you need to do exercises like good mornings, stiff legged deadlifts, and deadlifts with a rep where you can challenge that posture but hold that posture isometrically. So for instance if 205 is where your, your form is breaking down in a deadlift that means that weight's too much for you to hold that position um, and therefore your body has to in, has to your body takes up the strategy of rounding your back and reducing the lever arm, which makes it easier for your body to lift the weight. To strengthen up that position, you maybe need to take your 10 rep max, say your 10 rep max now in perfect form is 140, which may or may not be the case, but let's say it is. So that gives you a, a 1 RM with perfect form um, of say 200, and then a 205 it breaks down. Let's say you take your 10 RM with perfect form and build it up to 160 or 170. Now that you can perform 160 or 170 for 10 reps with perfect form in brackets, you can now go on deadlift 220, 230 with perfect form, but then as soon as you try deadlift 240, you'll round. Everyone's got the same biting point between their the postural strength of their the muscles of the spine and just picking up a weight. There'll come a point when you have to round to lift up a weight. It's your body's strategy of coping with that situation. If you ever look at anyone in a powerlifting meet or in a strongman meet, when there's some kind of maximal deadlifting task, everyone rounds at some point because everyone um, hits the point where the the postural muscles of their back aren't strong enough to hold that position, and therefore their body has to adopt a, a rounded position to accommodate for that fact to make the lift easier. Um, okay, hopefully that answers your question, Ash. Um, next question comes from Cameron. Mark, how do I taper my training before a 1RM attempt? I believe people decrease their training intensity for a week. What do you recommend? I squat at 195 yesterday. I think 200 could be there. It could be done soon. So to answer this question, we're going to use a little example of Russian Masters. So here you see the nine-week program marked out where the reps are the blue. The number, total number of reps or working reps are the blue bars, and the red lines the intensity and that's defined as percentage of your 1RM. So as you can see, for the first four weeks, which is called is it the foiling phase, the number of reps increases week on week, and the intensity stays exactly the same, and then what you see is an intensity, or what's to call an intensification phase. This is effectively a taper. Um, so what you get on week five is you get a drop in volume, increase in intensity. Week six, same again. Week seven, same again. Week Week 8 is two sets of two at what should have been your 1RM at the start of the program, and then you get max week. So as you can see, this tapers effectively over um, a five-week period that leads to a max at 105% or more of your um, 1RM. So that's, that's essentially, that's what a taper is. It's a drop-off of volume and an increase of intensity over time. Um, what some most powerlifters will do that over um, a, a two, three week phase. Um, in the build up to that meet, what I would do is I'd ramp my intensity and drop my volume maybe three, four weeks out. And then on the last week, uh, or the week of the meet, that, that's more, that's, that's just a rest week. So I, I wouldn't, you maybe do openers on a Monday if you want, and then you take the rest of the week off. So in essence, on this diagram, the last, um, the last week is your rest week. So you do two sets of two at 100%, and with a lot less volume on week eight, and then on week nine you take a rest week. So say your your second squat session, which is the hardest through the program, that's on a Friday, and your first one's on a Monday. What that would effectively mean is your last heavy workout would be on the Friday of week eight. You'd have an easy workout on Monday of week nine, and then you'd have a really easy week. Up, leading up to the Friday, so you're fresh for the Friday, and then you'd max out, and that's effectively what a taper and a peak is. Um, so what you could do is next week, if you're going to max, is you take the take the rest. The, you take Monday to f you take 
whatever portion of the week of this week or next week you need to take easy and then you just max out and then hopefully you'll hit your 200 um, good luck with that hope that answers your question that concludes this episode um, any questions please send them via email to speed fitness power or sorry <laughs> I'll do that again speed power performance at gmail.com leave a comment below I'll answer as many questions as I can get and that concludes this episode see you next time